It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Evan Tiffany, who will be providing our FAS eSampler lecture on the coronavirus trolley pricing lives in a pandemic. Dr. Tiffany. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about everybody's favorite subject, the coronavirus. Um, and as Bettina mentioned, this is, I've, I've cut this from one of the lectures that I did in my uh, introductory ethics class. Um, and so I'm just gonna try to raise some questions, raise some issues for things for us to think about. And I might go a little more quickly over this in this forum than I would if this were my class and I was going to be testing you on the material. Um, so there'll be plenty of time in Q&A if you want me to go back over some things that I might have gone over rather quickly. Uh, so I'm going to situate this by first talking about this thought experiment that's been very prevalent in philosophy known as the trolley problem. So you imagine there's a trolley with the brakes cut and it's out of control hurtling towards five people who are tied up on the track ahead of it. Oh no! Um, fortunately, you happen to be standing next to a switch on uh, the side of the track, which you could pull if you want, directing the trolley onto this other track. Unfortunately, on that track, there is one person tied down. So do you pull the switch, right? What are the kinds of morally relevant factors that you think about? I mean, certainly you would only be killing, or only one person would be dying rather than five, but are there other morally relevant factors? Um, do we need to keep in mind the rights of the person who's being tied down? So philosophers have used this thought experiment as a way to um, probe questions about rightness, wrongness, um, rights. Uh, there have been lots of different versions of it. So for example, a lot of people have the intuition that says, sure, uh, you know, I'll pull, the, I'll pull the switch and direct the trolley. But then you say, okay, but what's the difference between that and the version where you're standing on a footbridge and you can save these five, but that would require pushing this person off the footbridge so that their body then stops the trolley. Um, a lot of people would say, well, no, no, you can't do that. You can't push someone off a bridge. And so then, you know, okay, well, what's the difference? Aren't they both cases of killing one and saving five, right? Why is one permissible and one not permissible? Um, or another way in the original version of this, it wasn't somebody standing next to the side of the track, but a driver. So is it relevant whether you are driving the trolley or whether you're just a bystander um, standing next to a switch? So some people might think it matters whether or not you are merely a bystander who's passive. And therefore, if you do nothing, you're merely allowing those five to die. Whereas if you are the driver or if you're pulling the switch, now you are causally engaging in it. You're changing the course of events. So if you pull the lever or if you direct the trolley, now do you count as having killed that person? And is that worse than merely allowing five to die? Um, so those are some of the kinds of questions that we think about. Um, now this trolley problem has become quite famous. Um, it's even worked its way into the popular media um, oh, and so in terms of this driver question, one thing I like to do now, now that we have these self-driving cars, this isn't just fanciful thought experiments anymore. Like these are questions that we're gonna have to start getting answers to. So for example, there's a recent case where an Uber driver who was driving one of these self-driving cars, while the car was in self-driving mode, it hit some pedestrians and killed them. Recently, the, that driver has been charged with negligent homicide. Is, is that right? Is that what should happen? If you are behind the wheel of a car, even if it's in self-driving mode and that car is self, something malfunctions in the self-driving software and it kills somebody, who's responsible? The software developers, the auto manufacturer, the person behind the wheel, right? These are questions that we're gonna have to have answers to. Um, now this trolley problem has kind of hit the mainstream. Um, for example, it recently was featured in, uh, or I guess it's a couple years ago now, an episode of the television show, The Good Place. If you feel like you're engaging with the material, like with the trolley problem, that was just tricky, that's all. Why don't you just tell me the right answer? Well, that's what's so great about the trolley problem is that there is no right answer. Uh. 
this is why everyone hates moral philosophy professors. I'm on your side here, dude, but he is not wrong. Let's try this. Okay, so that's the Charlie problem uh, in sitcom land. It's also made it into the mainstream insofar as um, you're starting to actually see references to this in news articles. So for example, in this article, the author is using this Charlie problem as a way of talking about the coronavirus pandemic and uh, using it as a vehicle for comparing Sweden's approach to other approaches. So for example, um, here, they're clearly using the metaphor of the trolley. So instead of like a literal trolley, now we're imagining it's a global pandemic heading for your country. Um, and then, as they say in the article, this thought experiment has parallels in a real life experiment Sweden is conducting with its 10 million citizens. Though a majority of nations have opted to pull the lever and shift tracks to a lockdown strategy, thereby sacrificing economic growth, Sweden has continued on the same line. So if we unpack this a bit, how are they representing it? I mean, it's not literal. Now we no longer have sort of literally five people tied down and one person tied down. Instead, they're representing the, the alternative track, the, the track where you pull the lever as the lockdown strategy. So on this track, you have lockdown where we're all in our houses and we're sad because we don't get to go out and see people anymore. Businesses are closed and this leads to an economic downturn. Now, the other track is a little bit harder to kind of pin down exactly um, how to represent that, but presumably it's just the opposite of lockdown. So businesses remain open, people can still go out and, and interact with each other and have fun. Um, now, as it says in the article, it's not quite right. It's not like Sweden didn't literally do a, a have a do nothing approach. You know, they still encouraged people to social distance. They still encourage people to work from home, but they just, didn't take the same sort of forced lockdown that many countries took. So if we want to think about how to compare these two strategies, how do we do that? Right? How do we engage in this? You know, if, if we just want to look at five deaths versus one death, cost benefit, how do we do the cost benefit analysis? Well, first we have to identify what the costs and the benefits are. So the cost here is clearly an economic cost, right? We've all seen the numbers. Um, these numbers are a little bit out of date. This is from the summer, but both Canada, the US, a lot of the world, right, you're seeing record unemployment, unemployment rates going way up, participation in job rates going down, huge job losses, businesses are closing. Right, that's clearly the, the cost, that's the downside. Now the benefit is supposed to be a decrease in the infection rate, it's supposed to be a health benefit, right? We slow the spread. Um, so. We're all now familiar with that flattening the curve, right? We've been hearing about this for months now. And that's the whole idea is that when we go into this lockdown and we do things like remote lectures, instead of me showing up in person at the high school um, teaching, right? We're just trying to keep things manageable so that those people who do get infected, um, the health system can, can accommodate that capacity. So what about the other track? What are the costs and benefits there? Well, we know that one cost for not going into lockdown is, you know, increase in infection rates and increase in death rates. I mean, just look at what's happening in the U.S. in places that didn't go into lockdown. Right? Now, again, these are from the summer, but even more recent, um, you can look at uh, colleges, universities in the U.S. that tried to hold in-person classes. They're all now scrambling, sending people home. It's just this giant mess there. Um, so that seems to be the cost, right? The cost is a health cost to not going into lockdown. Now, in theory, the benefit is supposed to be economic. That is, we're supposed to lose fewer jobs. Businesses don't have to close. There's going to be less of an impact on the environment, not the environment, on the economy. So that's supposed to be the main benefit. Now, in Sweden's case, they were also trying to 
their theory was that they could develop herd immunity, not herd mentality. You know, they're trying to develop herd immunity, um, which would then lead to a long-term decrease in the infection rate. I'm not going to focus so much on that today, um, in large part because there's just so many unknowns with that strategy. It feels a bit risky to me. Like, we don't even know if herd immunity is possible with this virus. Um, the data is changing all the time. Seems like a really risky strategy. Um, Instead, what I want to focus on is just how do we even go about doing this cost benefit analysis. So in the lockdown, we said we had a health benefit and an economic cost In the non lockdown was the opposite. We had a health cost and an economic benefit. But notice, and then we want to say which of these is better, which of these is, is, you know, has the better cost benefit analysis. But notice what we're comparing, what we're comparing here. We're comparing two things that seem like they're incomparable. We're comparing lives or health and the economy. But how do we compare these things? How do you, how do you decide between lives and money? How do you decide between lives and the economy? Um, so some politicians in the US um, made suggest stated things like, well, there are more important things than, than living and that's saving the country. And by saving the country, he meant money, right? The economy. Um, suggest grandparents willing to die for the U.S. economy and faced a lot, like politicians who said this, faced a lot of criticism, um, including from other politicians. So here you have New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo saying, you know, or tweeting, my mother's not expendable, your mother is not expendable. We will not put a dollar figure on human life. Now, that is certainly true in some sense, and it's a good political statement, but the point I want to make here is that it's really important to distinguish two very different ideas. So the one idea is this idea that we can put a price on a particular individual's life, right? That we can say, you know, this particular person is expendable or this particular person is life is worth, you know, X amount. But it's important to distinguish that idea from this idea that we can put a price on a statistical life. That is that we can come up with some measure whereby we can put some value on statistical life in order to make public policy decisions. And I wanna suggest that it's important to keep these two different ideas distinct and that a lot of times in the political discourse, they get conflated and run together. So for example, if folks on this first one, this is a view that has echoes in the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who's writing in the 1600s. Hobbes wrote, the value or worth of a man is, as of all other things, his price. That is to say, so much as would be given for the use of his power. Now, you might think, okay, well, what does that mean? Like, what is Hobbes saying here? What does he mean when he says the worth of man is, of all other things, his price? Basically, what I think he's saying is that when you think of value, all value is relational, and even the value of life is like a commodity. So if you think about commodities, how, how do we know how much the US dollar is worth? How, much do, how do we know how much a gram of gold is worth? How do we know how much a barrel of oil is worth? Well, you look at the market, right? How much is somebody willing to pay for gold? How much is somebody willing to pay for oil? You let the market determine the value of a commodity. That's kind of what we mean when we talk about commodifying or when economists talk about commodifying things, right? You let the market determine its value. And so what Hobbes seems to be saying is you do the same thing for people, right? How much is a grandma worth? Well, who's, what are you willing to pay, right? What, how much is somebody willing to pay for your labor? Now that idea is rightly criticizable. Um, for one thing, it suggests that the value of, you know, a coal miner or a factory worker, someone who has, you know, makes a lower salary is somehow worth less than the Wall Street executive, the corporate lawyer, the person who makes lots of money. And that just seems clearly wrong, right? It just seems clearly wrong to say that your life is worth less because somebody is willing to pay less for your labor, that you don't make as much money. Right. Our moral sentiment seems to be that people have a kind of equality to them, that their people are equal. It doesn't matter how much money you make, your life should be valued equally as everyone else. Now, this idea was given voice by another philosopher who was writing about a century after Hobbes, known as Immanuel Kant, or named Immanuel Kant. So Kant wrote, 
Everything has either a price or a dignity. What has a price can be replaced by something else as its equivalent. Right? You can have an exchange rate. What on the other hand is raised above all price and therefore admits of no equivalent has a dignity. Whatever has reference to general human inclinations and needs has a market price, but humanity has not merely a relative worth that is a price, but has an intrinsic worth that is a dignity. Now you might be thinking, I did not understand any of what you just said. And that's because Kant is notoriously obscure. Um, when I teach, I try not to actually assign any Kant until the upper level of university, because um, he's just very difficult to read. Um, but what I take him to be saying is roughly something like the following. Humanity, personhood, our status as human beings, our status as persons cannot be commodified. Most things you can turn into a commodity. You can turn food into a commodity, shelter into a commodity, even events or entertainment you can turn into a commodity. You can't turn our status as human beings into a commodity. Humans, right, our, our intrinsic humanity, you, you just can't put a price on that. It's not something that can be bought and sold on a market, right? Or another way to think about this is that Right. He's saying humanity has an intrinsic worth, a dignity. Right? No matter how little you make, even if you're homeless, even if nobody is willing to pay anything for your labor, you still have value. You still have worth um, in virtue of your humanity. Right? Just in virtue of being a human being, a person, you have a kind of intrinsic worth, a dignity. That, and, you, and that's the thing that you can't put a price on. That's the thing that can't be commodified. Um, and so I take that like that basic idea to be in stark contrast to that Hobbesian idea that value is just about what somebody is willing to pay. Um, now, does this mean, so suppose you think there's something to this idea, right? That, yeah, you know, humanity has this kind of intrinsic worth to it. It doesn't matter how much you make, like you, your life still has value and has equal value to everyone else. Does that, entail then that we think that human life has infinite value, that it is literally priceless. I don't think there's a strict entailment there. And in fact, I don't think that any of us would actually agree that life has infinite value or that it's literally priceless. Think about policies like speed limits. So here's some random data I found. Um, from 1993 to 2017, increased speed limits on US highways resulted in an additional 36,760 traffic fatalities. And yet nobody is clamoring to see the speed limits lowered. Right? If we literally thought that human life was, was, had infinite value, that it was priceless, we would be willing to spend any amount, we would be willing to pay any amount just to save even one life. And yet nobody is suggesting that we lower the speed limit on Highway 1, the Trans-Canada Highway, to 10 kilometers an hour, right? We would have fewer traffic fatalities if we lowered the speed limit to 10 kilometers an hour. None of us want to do that, which suggests that there, we are willing to engage in some kinds of trade-offs here. We're not thinking of human life as literally infinite value, that we're literally willing to pay anything to even prevent one death. Or think about ways governments often think about um, what, what to spend money on and how to spend money. Suppose you have a local municipality that's deciding, you know, maybe there's a part of the highway that's slightly dangerous and you know, should we straighten it out? Maybe blast that hill there, um, uh, make it a little straighter so you increase visibility. How do you decide whether that's a project that's worth spending money on? Well, first you have to figure out how much it will cost. That's gonna be a dollar amount, right? How much money are we spending? Then you figure out how many lives will be saved, right? How many traffic fatalities do we have? If we straighten this out, how much can we expect that number to decrease, right? How many lives on balance are we gonna save? But now we're back to that same problem of comparing money and lives, right? In order to make this, in order to do the cost benefit, we need some way of translating those lives into dollars, right? We need some kind of exchange rate here. Otherwise, how are we going to know whether it's worth spending $10 million on this project as opposed to some other project? Now, economists have been doing this for decades now, um, using this concept of the value of a statistical life. And often many public policy decisions that are made 
depend on quantifying the value of human life, life in precisely this way. Um, if the government is deciding whether to mandate auto manufacturers to put airbags in their cars, right? Well, that's going to be slightly more expensive. Cars are going to cost slightly more. So they have to figure out, you know, is this worth that um, regulation um, or, you know, speed limits or those pro um, spending money to flatten out, uh, make roads safer, those kinds of things. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind, and this is that distinction I was trying to draw earlier, is that this concept of the value of a statistical life, the VSL, is not about pricing individual lives. Right? That's why it's called a statistical life. Right? We're not putting a price tag on any one person. So the way economists define this is a local trade-off rate between fatality risk and money. Now, as I tell my students, I don't, you don't need to worry about, you know, if you want to know more about the, this technical definition, go take an economics course. I'm not an economist. I'm interested in, in the morality of it. Um, so two things to keep in mind by what, what they're getting at with this concept. One, as I said before, it's not valuing individual lives. Instead, it's a way of trying to measure how much people are willing to pay to decrease the probability of death. So rather than in that Cobbsian sense, relying on what other people are willing to pay for your life, right? Where other people are determining the value of your life. The idea behind this is that we look at people's choices and we look at what those choices reveal about how people value their own lives, right? So if I take a job that has a slightly increased risk of fatality and in order to compensate for that, I need extra money, that economists say reveals how I'm valuing my own life. So um, let me give you, well, I'm starting to run out. I'm going to skip over this idea of revealed preference. So the idea behind revealed preference is just, there's what you say your preferences are. So you might say you prefer healthy food like kale salad, but it, you know, if it comes time to order your food, you end up ordering the carne asada burrito with extra guacamole. Your revealed preference is you actually prefer tasty food to healthy food. You can see my bias there by phrasing it as tasty versus healthy. Um, okay, so the idea is that you take any sort of risky job and you ask the following question, how much more do you have to pay a worker to take that risk? So to give a fictional example, suppose there's a job where compared to other similar jobs, you have one extra death per year per 5,000 workers. So that's a, a slight increase in the probability of death. Suppose that when you do that and you look at a number of different of these comparables, you find that in the slightly riskier job, each worker is paid on average an extra $2,000. So what the economist does, it, then it multiplies those two numbers, the, the 5,000 times the 2,000 and it gets 10 million, right? That's the value of the statistical life. If it takes $2,000 in order to take that slightly extra risk of death, that means that your preference, your revealed preferences is that you are valuing your life at around $10 million. Economists currently um, estimate the VSL anywhere from 9 million to 11 million. So let me just show you how this works then. Suppose that you're trying to figure out the cost, do the cost benefit analysis on a lockdown strategy. Suppose your estimates are that the economy has shrunk by $7.2 trillion over what it would have shrunk by had you not gone into lockdown. So that's the, the cost, 7.2 trillion cost. And let's say you estimate that by going into lockdown, you save 1.2 million lives. Converting that using the VSL of 10 million, just picking 10 million because it's you know in between the nine and 11, it's a nice round number. What that means is that in terms of economic savings, the value of the lives saved is valued at $12.4 trillion, which means when you compare these that even if you're just going by a purely economic calculus, you're not thinking about you know, lives being um, infinitely valuable or um, priceless, even on a purely economic analysis, you have a net benefit of $5.2 trillion by going into lockdown. Now, as I said before, I'm not an economist, uh, so my focus isn't so much on the math there, but 
looking morally at these models and what these models reveal and whether there are some shortcomings. So one moral shortcoming I see in these models is that they do not consider the distribution of risks and benefits. That is, they seem to assume a kind of random distribution. But one thing that we've, dis what we've learned, as you see it, like in headlines like this one, is that it's revealing a lot of the inequalities that we see in society, right? The distribution of risk and benefits is not equally shared across society. The people who make less money are actually bearing a higher portion of the burdens, right? They're carrying the greater risk. I mean, being a university professor is a fairly privileged position and I get to do my job from the safety of my own home or in my office with no one around me. Um, I don't have to be interacting with people on a daily basis. So remember this example from how we economists get at the VSL looking at revealed preference? The whole premise behind this model is that people require to be paid more to take extra risk. That's the whole thing. The VSL is completely based on this idea that increased risk comes with increased benefit, right? That you get paid more for increased risk. That's not what we're seeing happening, um, right? The people that are taking the most risk are the ones who are being paid the least. Um, so like, I don't know, there might be some high school teachers out there on this, on this call, right? They're accepting the risk with the face-to-face -face classes. I don't think they're getting hazard pay for that increased risk. Um, so that seems to be a moral shortcoming with this model, right? Is this model that economists have developed even appropriate when addressing uh, coronavirus, co the COVID pandemic, given that it's premised on this idea that we have these free choices and we can choose riskier jobs or less risky jobs and we will only take the riskier job if we're paid more. But that's not what's happening. Oops. We're also seeing racial discrepancies. Another recent article, those who identified as West Asian, Latin American and South Asian were the most likely to report difficulties in meeting financial needs. So again, we're seeing right, the risk and benefits are not being equally distributed and these economic models are not accounting for that. And that seems to be morally relevant. Um, right, it seems like to go back to that initial trolley example, are we saying, well, sorry, we've got to pull the switch and, and have one demographic bear the brunt of the risk so that the you know, rich white guy can you know, be safe in his um, socially isolated home office. If that's what's happening, that seems like it would be morally problematic. Right, so one problem is that this model just does not consider how these risks and benefits are being distributed across society and whether certain segments of our society are being asked to bear the brunt of the risk and the harms. Another problem is that inequalities are just intrinsically built right into the math, right? So if you think back to this, idea, it's all based on revealed preference, but your preferences themselves are going to be shaped by the social context. And if the background social context is one of inequality, that's going to work itself into the math. So rich people are less willing to assume, are willing to assume less risk than poorer people, right? If you have a good pension plan, if you have a safety net, you're going to be less willing to assume risk. Um, same thing with citizens of richer nations. People with better safety nets or who live in countries with better safety nets are going to be less willing to assume risk. So then you're, you seem like you're just getting this feedback loop where you have this model built on preference, but preference is shaped by social context. If that social context has inequality built into it, you're just going to get this feedback loop. Um, so one way to think about the upshot here is that, you know, originally I started this as a kind of, well, we're trying to balance lives in the economy. And so maybe it's not really just a simple trade-off between lives and the economy, but it's this highly complex balancing act where we have lives, we have the economy, we have mental health and well-being, we have um, people's ability to um, carry on and, you know, keep their businesses open, their livelihood do the things that brings them joy in life, um, trying to make sure that, our, that the way in which we are asking people to bear some of the, the costs and the harms is being more equally distributed across society. And so we're trying to balance all of these complex factors. Um, just one quick th last point I wanted to make is that 
Also, a lot of these discussions focus merely on the impact on our society, right? So what should we be doing? Um, when I was talking about the lockdown versus non-lockdown, I was talking about costs and benefits to us. But as uh, some authors have pointed out, our approaches have global impact. So in this article from The Conversation, um, this, uh, a professor, a philosophy professor in South Africa was pointing out that, look, in Africa, millions of people will starve to death if the global economy enters a protracted downturn. So that's another complication here, right? Even if it's better for us to go into lockdown, what are the global implications of that? Is this going to have far-reaching repercussions across the globe? And how do we factor that into um, our approaches? Uh, there was this interesting documentary. If you're interested, just go to the conversation. You can look it up. You can Google Alex Broadbent, um, uh, where he talks about the impact of lockdown on the world's poor. Um, and that's my presentation. <laughs>